going to start. This is our international treasure room because here you get to see examples of some of the imported luxury items that came off of the boat. And these things are really surprising because we think of frontier life as having been very, very basic. And certainly that was true for most pioneers, but apparently there were some richer people who could afford things like China from England and coffee beans from South America, which still smelled like coffee after 132 years underground. There were also several varieties of French perfume that were still fragrant. And in fact, they were able to send a couple of those to a lab in New York where they were analyzed and reproduced for us. So in the museum, you do get a chance to smell what rich people wanted to smell like in 1856. And this, this was an important luxury for men and for women because people just did not have the chance to bathe very often in 1856. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any women's dresses in our collection because cotton was one thing that dissolved underwater. It just absolutely turned to mush. But they did find the buttons from the dresses at the bottom of each box. And these were printed to match, so we call them calico buttons. And there are actually 109 different distinct patterns that came off of the boat. And so that shows us that there was a lot of variety available for those who could afford it. Although most people still had to make their own clothes at home at this point. It was actually because of westward expansion and men going out west first to establish a homestead that there was a demand for ready-to-wear clothing for the first time in the 1850s. So what, what about the uh, trade the beads? beads? These, there were three and a half million of them on the boats. They were imported all the way from Italy, and they were mainly tr used in trade with the Native Americans, and they're, they're absolutely beautiful. It took several years to clean and sort all of those. Now, unlike cotton, the fabrics that were made from animal proteins, like wool and silk, those things actually held up pretty well. So for example, right here we have a wool felt hat with a silk ribbon. And we also have about 4,000 leather boots and shoes that came off of the boat. And they had been stitched together with cotton thread. And so of course that cotton had dissolved. So every single piece of footwear has to be re-stitched by hand using the original holes. And then we have to soak it in PEG, that food preservative that I was talking about earlier. And then we have to freeze dry it. So that process from start to finish takes about four months for just one boot. So today we still have about 2,400 left to go. So we've been working on these for more than 20 years and we still have more than half of them left to do. On um, the other hand, the china and the glass were easy. All they had to do was wash them and put them on display. So they did those items first. So you'll see lots and lots of beautiful dishes in the museum. Uh, this is the this is ma manufactured by the Davenport Workshop in Staffordshire, England. This is the this is what we call the cypress pattern, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And most of the artifacts, about 80% of the artifacts in our collection, are actually brand new even though they're over 150 years old, meaning they've never been used. They were brand new merchandise heading out to general stores on the frontier when the boat sank. There were not a lot of valuables on the boat. Again, they were, they were hoping to find gold, they were hoping to get rich, but this is just about all of the gold that they found right here. It's mostly jewelry. Um, they found a total of 26 cents. That's all the money that came off the boat. Because again, everybody survived when the boat sank, and there's, there's that 26 cents. And that's a good thing that everybody survived. Um, but there were things of daily life left behind. It. We even have some children's toys. Up here we have some seashells and some clay marbles. Uh, we have a little tin rickshaw. So here are the children's toys, some seashells, some clay marbles, a tin rickshaw, a little game piece and die. And right here in the center of this case, we have a tiny little porcelain doll. And she's one of my favorite things that came from the boat. She's called a frozen Charlotte doll. And she was actually a really popular doll in the 1850s, kind of like the Barbie doll of her time. And she was based on a folk song which told the tale of a teenage girl who supposedly lived in Vermont and she was going to a New Year's dance in the next town with her boyfriend, Charlie, in an open sleigh. So her mother warned her to bundle up with a blanket because it was cold outside, obviously. But 
She did not because she wanted everybody to see her brand new silk dress. And so poor Charlotte did not make it to the dance. She froze to death on the way there. And so you'll notice that her arms are frozen into place holding onto the carriage bar. And that seems like a pretty morbid children's toy by today's standards, of course, but there is a moral to this story. What do, what do you folks think the lesson of that story is? Bundle up. Bu bundle up, but more importantly, he's right, listen to your parents. And that's why this was a popular gift for parents to give to their children. And we actually do have these for, some reproductions of these for sale up in the gift shop, in case you're interested. And yeah, are these more trade beads here? Absolutely. These are some more examples of the trade beads that came off of the boat. And again, they, they were manufactured in Italy. And what they would do is they would blow a little bubble of glass and then they, they would use two steel rods on either end to just stretch that bubble of glass until it became very, very, very thin. And that air bubble in the middle becomes the hole in the center of the bead. And then they would cut that up into tiny little pieces and polish it and ship it all the way across the ocean. And then it would get on a railroad to St. Louis where all of the, the warehouses were. And that's as far as the railroad went in 1856. So then from St. Louis, all of these items had to get on a steamboat and they had to come out here uh, to the frontier and they ended up in general stores or trade with the Native Americans. And it was very, as, as you can probably tell. What did the Native Americans want mostly besides trade beads? That's an excellent question. Anything in the museum with a little teepee symbol next to it is something that was often traded. Um, so a lot of things, but especially things that are decorative. So the, the trade beads and... Yeah, point a few of those out when you get a chance. Sure, absolutely. Go along. Okay. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the... Well, right here we have some tin cups that were popular. Uh, and a lot of the things were not necessarily used for their original function but for uh, tying onto or sewing onto clothing to create a, either a decorative or a noisy effect, mm -hmm. which was very, very desirable. Um, a lot of this tinware in this case still had prices written on the bottom, which ranged from about one to two dollars, um, which is a pretty good amount of money considering that the guys who built the boat made about 15 cents an hour. The dark solder lines on the tin, that's all lead, so you definitely don't want to use these items today. What are these, forks? Yes, those are, those are forks. There was lots and lots of silverware, lots of dishware going out west. We don't actually have any silver flatware, though. It's all tin or pewter, um, and that's interesting because Outside of this collection, the cheaper flatware is rare. It doesn't usually get saved and passed down to the next generation. And so it's, it's funny that the things of daily life from the past often are more rare than the fancy expensive things. And, and that's what's so unique about this collection is that it is a, it's a time capsule of all of the ordinary everyday things. Of, of life on the frontier. And so a lot of people will come into our museum and say that they don't normally enjoy museums very much, but, but they, they recognize a lot of these items and, uh, and it, it paints a picture of daily life. So um, over here, some examples of China that came off of the boat. Those are whale oil lamps, and you'll notice that they don't have any globes on top. And that's because whale oil was cleaner burning, it was less smoky, and it was brighter burning than kerosene. So when whale oil started to become scarce and people switched to kerosene, they started to make glass globes that would go on top of the lamps. Native Americans probably like these knives. Absolutely. Definitely. The 
there were actually about 60 leather book covers that were found on the boat. And here are a couple of examples. The paper pages inside had dissolved, but we do have the spine from the complete works of William Shakespeare right here. And we also have a, a beautiful gold leaf embellished cover from a volume of the poems of Ossian. Now, obviously, Shakespeare continues to be very popular today. Ossian is a little bit more obscure. Uh, supposedly, Ossian was an ancient Scottish Gaelic poet, uh, but as soon as this was initially published, there were some doubts about whether all of these poems could really be attributed to one single poet, because apparently ancient Scottish poetry is a, an oral tradition. So this, this was a this was published in the mid-19th century, and it was popular at the time, but it's, it's not something that you're going to run across in your literature classes today.